Hello students, welcome back. I am back on the Good Yeti microphone and recording. Um, if I pause partway through, it is because I am coughing. I will try to mute the microphone before I cough. Uh, not totally over this cough and evening time tends to make it worse. I have taken some medicine, um, so this might be a really, really interesting podcast uh, or recording, whatever we want to call this thing, um, because of the medicine. But um, I think it should go just fine. So today we are talking about the advantages and disadvantages of Confederation because it is important you know that it wasn't just like one day they decided to make Canada the end. Um, so yay, here's my happy graphic. It's a fist bump. Um, yeah, so there are good reasons to Confederate. And there were definitely some reasons not to confederate, um, particularly for some of the various territories, and we'll get to that shortly, hopefully. Okay, so first of all, we need to talk about some of the reasons that people were wanting to unite British North America. Um, it's already been mentioned that, hey, this could be cool, we could have this great, like, country that spanned both oceans and wouldn't that be wonderful and everyone could be happy and we could have this economy and all these great things thanks lord durham you're the best um so one of the good reasons i mean a lot of these reasons they have to do with money money it does tend to be uh, an important part of all of this um so one of the ideas is if they had one country then they could just get rid of all these tariffs that they had going from colony to colony. So if you went to like New Brunswick or to Nova Scotia or whatever, you had to pay a tariff to that government and then that government had to pay tariffs to your country and all that kind of, your colony, not country. Um, and so it was, it was kind of slow and expensive and uh, it didn't really kind of promote uh, economic cooperation in the area and so that would be one thing that they could fix another one would be having an actually united economy so everybody's in this together and then you know everybody's looking out for everyone else that would be cool so hey you know like it's great that you're really good at fishing and we're good at um, making maple syrup and, and all that kind of stuff why don't we work together and then we could put like maple syrup and fish on the plate or, you know, we could be in charge of breakfast, and you could be in charge of dinner, and, but everybody's taken care of. That probably makes more sense. Although you couldn't put maple syrup on fish, uh, it actually is pretty good. You can make a really good sauce uh, with it, sort of like a teriyaki kind of thing. Um, another thing is, of course, this encourages trade between the colonies, as I already mentioned. So trading maple syrup for fish and, you know, put a little maple syrup on the fish, whatever, it's cool. Um, another thing is... It would strengthen the government. Having these little co colonial governments, um, you know, that's nice and all, and you can get some things done, but having a stronger government uh, would allow you to make bigger and more important decisions. Uh, one of the really important decisions that would be beneficial from one big united country would be a railway to connect everybody because it's a big country, and so you want stuff to arrive uh, in one area and make its way to the next area over the land because not everything's accessible by boat and so a railway would be really really handy and we will get into why shortly um, another great thing is having a stronger government that can make decisions on language because having Canada West and Canada East arguing all the time uh, is gonna grind things to a halt so you can kinda like maybe work around the French people by including some other colonies in this country. Um, and then education, again, similar kind of situation. You've got different sets of values and beliefs and all that kind of stuff. So if you can get some sort of consensus, then maybe some decisions will start to happen. We will get to that too. All right. The other thing is one thing that is really important is that the United States is a powerful and scary country. They've already tried to attack Canada once and tried to invade and that was scary and bad back in 1812. And so uh, Canadians and uh, like Canada West and Canada East and everybody else, they're really concerned about losing contact with Rupert's land, that big, huge, massive land mass that goes from basically what we know of as Manitoba all the way to what we know of now as British Columbia and up north and everything else. So they're really concerned that the U.S. could get there first. And then the other one, of course, is... Um, 
British Columbia. There's weird things going on over there. So uh, wouldn't it be great if we could just unify and fix, fix that and not worry about the U.S. anymore? All right. So why do you need a railway? Well, railway, where, uh, bleh, railways look cool. Just ask Thomas the Tank Engine. Um, railways are great, and particularly during the Victorian era, the railway was very important. It was great for transportation. Uh, it allowed you to transport a lot of stuff fairly quickly, comparatively quickly at the time, and it could haul huge amounts of goods. Uh, long distance over land and you didn't have to worry and so one of the great things was that ships could arrive in Halifax because um, despite the fact that the the oceans might be more difficult to navigate and all that kind of stuff there wasn't as much ice and so you could uh, arrive in Halifax in the winter time drop off your goods and then a train could transport it to uh, Toronto or Montreal or any other place in the area. We could connect all these major cities and wouldn't that be great? We could get, you know, our tea and crumpets from England and then ship them our maple syrup and fish and we could do that really quickly and smoothly with a train system. Um, and so throughout this, we've, there's little railway systems along the way. Um, people like them. They like them over in England. They like them over in Europe, all that good stuff. Um, and, and they do seem to be beneficial for people. But they're really, really expensive to make because you need people to put down the ties and put down the nail them in and blow up the land and do all that kind of stuff. So they, they're really, really labor intensive. They're very, very expensive. And then the other, the, like we're going to find this out a little bit later. Canada has to learn this one the hard way. Uh, they tend not to be super, super profitable. Um, people don't like paying a lot of money to ship their goods and so uh yes it's this huge huge expensive process and then you're not going to make massive amounts of money back but i mean it's probably more profitable in the end uh for you as a consumer than you know shipping fish long distances from the atlantic into like rupert's land that's just probably not going to fly when you're doing it on a mule. Um, the fish probably won't be very good. All right. Um, America. Look, <laughs> that's a beautiful eagle. So America is a really important concern in this whole situation. So uh, I think we've talked about Manifest Destiny many times before. Just a reminder, that is the belief that uh, America this great, wonderful country has uh, God's blessing to go and conquer and expand westward. And so the idea is that America needs to expand and expand and expand and become this big country with lots of people. And it's going to be a haven, a utopia for everybody and everything's going to be great. And uh, people in Canada are like, wait, 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 they might move north and then what'll we do? And so that was a that was a big fear. And as I mentioned before, many Canadians were still concerned about the U.S., particularly since they had invaded Canada not that long ago, back in 1812. Um, you know, we're talking 50 years later. People still kind of remember that, and they're concerned. And there's other stuff going on in the U.S. right now. It's 1861 to 1865. There was an American Civil War. Um, I would encourage you, if you don't know anything about what the heck that means or what the difference between the American Civil War and the American Revolution is, um, oh my gosh, you've got some learning to do. Um, but the American Civil War, that's the one where the North fights the South over um, the right to own slaves, the right to determine policy, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so there's this huge divide in the United States and they fight and thousands and thousands and thousands of Americans get killed by other Americans. Um, so it's a bloody and, and horrific conflict. And Canada is watching and aware of it and is concerned and is concerned about the possibility that now that the war is over, the North, who is victorious, might come and invade Canada because Britain supported the South during the war and this like i had to like check this out and like like fact check and make sure that the, i was like what this doesn't make sense so britain a country has who has been anti-slavery for a really long long time like longer than most other countries 
in the world, um, Britain was supporting the South, the pro-slavery side, during the Civil War. And so there was some real fear that the North could kind of try to retaliate against Britain by attacking Canada. Wow. Um, so it is an unfortunate kind of side effect of being affi closely affiliated to Britain is that you get to like face the fallout of their really bad decisions too. Um, okay, so some pros and cons of confederation. Well, number one, this is so this is a, a pro and a con of confederation. Um, so government in nor uh, in Canada West and Canada East was really really inefficient at the time. So that is changing. A new confederation could maybe fix that problem. So if you were in Canada West or Canada East, um, you you want confederation to help kind of fix the problems with your government. If you're a problem, if you're one of the other colonies, that would be very bad. You would be joining, you know, a a place that has terrible government. That was a cough break. Okay, so the United Canada's, as I just mentioned, they had a united government, but it was really, really inefficient. And what I mean by inefficient is that things were not getting done. People were stopping to argue a lot. And so because there were no political parties in this new country, uh, this united Canada, um, groups within the government, they had to unify on their own. So it's like, hey, you like the color blue, I like the color blue too. Let's vote together on this particular thing, and wouldn't that be great? And we're, we're best buddies for a little while. And then tomorrow, a guy shows up and he's like, hey, you like, you like Coca-Cola? I like Coca-Cola too. Let's be buddies. And so I ditched my friend who liked the color blue. And, you know, because I changed my mind, I've now like, we're not going to vote together. We're going to disagree on different issues. And then suddenly, like this whole plan that we had to pass a law together, it fails because I changed my mind. Because I'm a jerk. And so um, this comes down to, like, so all of this politics gets governed by temporary alliances and coalitions. So let's say, like, me and my buddy Steve, we are an alliance, and we're going to work together, and we are going to pass a law that makes sure that, you know, French people can have Sundays off. They're not going to have to work. Cool. So me and what was his name? Steve? I don't know. Steve and I, we're, we're trying to pass this law. And Steve and I, I'm counting on Steve's vote. If I can get Steve, he's going to go get his friend uh, Colin. And then I'm going to go get my other friend Jason. And so me, Steve, and Colin, we're all going to vote together. But as we're doing this, um, Colin and Steve, they, they kind of, they meet up with somebody else and, and that person pulls them away. And then the next thing you know, our bill doesn't pass because we lost those votes that we were supposed to have because of something else. Somebody works out a special deal where it's like, well, if you vote no on this law, but you vote yes on this law, then we could make this kind of thing happen. If you're curious about how this kind of works, uh, you could watch the show House of Cards. Uh, it kind of talks about how that sort of thing happens in the United States government even today still because people are always like being sneaky and agreeing and making coalitions and alliances and oh, it's exciting stuff. So you know, I hope, you know, government, it can be, it can be kind of exciting or it can be kind of boring and dry, but uh, we'll, we'll try to, we'll try to make it exciting whenever we can. So um, the big problem is that the French and the English, they disagree on so, so many issues. So not lots and lots of things are just not getting done. Let's get to it. So the first guy we needed to talk about, and this is Canada East. So this is the, the French Canada. Our first guy Man, he's handsome. This is Louis-Joseph Papineau. And he has wicked awesome hair. Like, look at that. Like, he's got that wicked, like, faux hawk thing kind of going on. But he's, like, old and white. And I love the way they pop their collars up. It's so good. He just, like, looks like the most surly grandpa kind of thing. I, like, he's great. So, uh, Louis-Joseph Papineau, apart from looking awesome, he led a group called the Parti Rouge. And so they're not quite a political party, but they're a political group. And they're, they're kind of like a party at the time. And so these guys are super opposed to 
English commercial interests. So he's French, he's trying to defend the French, he's trying to defend Eastern Canada, and he says, no, we just gotta keep the English influence out of this place. No English goods, no English stuff, no English influence, just like no English economy in Canada East. They're bad. And so he's, and him and his party, they absolutely hate the idea of a union because a union would mean, well, Canada East is going to become very, very weak. It's not going to have power and play. And so that would be really, really bad. That would be awful for them. Uh, they could lose their culture. They could lose their language. They could lose their rights and privileges and all that kind of stuff. And so uh, Louis-Joseph Papineau is very strongly French, French, French. And so uh, if you were a poor person, a French farmer, you would probably support the Parti Rouge. Um, you were not interested in building the economy through working with the English, all that kind of stuff. It was sticking to the old traditional way of doing things, despite the fact that you were modern and looked awesome with your cool suit. All right, the next guy. This guy is very, very cool, too. <coughs> Apologies, I missed the mute button the first time. Okay, this is George Etienne Cartier, and he's also from Canada East, so he's the other guy. So there are two parties in each, two major parties in each of the two Canadas. And so George Etienne Cartier, he leads the Parti Bleu. So we got, oh, I know, I'm sorry, I apologize for my blue, my terrible French. So we got the Parti Rouge and the Parti Bleu. Um, so the red guys and the blue guys. So the blue guys are a bit more progressive. They're really concerned about developing Canada's economy. They want to develop Canada East. They want to bring in business. They want to bring in jobs. They want to develop, develop, develop. What a great thing. But they still need to protect French culture, language, and their Catholic upbringing. So Catholicism is very important to Parte Bleu as well. I mean, Catholicism is important just kind of across the board when it comes to um, French Canadian-ness for a very long time. So keep that in mind. And But he's willing to work with Canada West. So he's the guy who's kind of playing some political games for French Canada. He's trying to work with, within the system to, to find a way to make it happen. Um, Georges Etienne Cartier is, is one of the most awesome and fascinating men. Um, honestly, like I'd love to just study, get a master's in history and study exclusively his life because he's a really cool dude. Okay, the next guy. Oh, man. I'm betting that his wife didn't marry him despite his facial hair. She married him because of his facial hair. Look at that. That is so good. All right. So George Brown, um, is he leads a group called the Clear Grits, and they are in Canada West. So we're now in the English-speaking English part of Canada. So the Clear Grits, they are trying to defend English-Canadian interests. It's all about English-Canadian interests. He doesn't like the French. He doesn't like Catholicism. He doesn't want to acquiesce to their request. He's just dry, trying to drive a hard line. And so he tries to make, he's trying to make the province of Canada West more democratic. In fact, he's trying to make all of Canada more democratic. And he's got this, he's really strongly in support of Rep by Pop. And I really hope that you're familiar with the term Rep by Pop. And I'm trying really hard not to pop my peas in the microphone. Um, so Rep by Pop is representation by population. And that means that it where basically um, the, the population gets to determine, like, okay, how am I explaining this? Okay, so the more population you have, the more representatives you have in government. There we go. That's the perfect explanation. So in Canada West, if there's a huge population in Canada West, then there should be plenty of representation of Canada West. And if there's a small population in Canada East, there should be a small representation of Canada East. So that means if you are French Canadian and you are the minority population, you will have the minority representation. Guess who's not going to like that idea? If you guess the French, you are correct. 
All right, so last guy we need to talk to talk about, and I really hope this face is familiar. If not, I'm very sorry. You've clearly not had many $10 bills, and I should be more nice to you. Um, John A. McDonald. You probably know that name. You probably are like, oh, 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 this guy. Okay, so he leads a group called the Tories, and so he's the other political party in Canada West. So in Canada East, we had the Parti Bleu and the Parti Rouge. In Canada West, we had the Clear Grits, and then it is Clear Grits, right? Great. Awesome. And then in Canada West, we had the Clear Grits and the Tories. The Tories are a bit more, they're, they're not quite as hard line and, and rigid as the clear grits, which makes sense. Hey, they're the gritty guys. These are the not gritty guys. Very cool. And so they're not quite as democratic as those other guys. They're not quite as all like, oh, rep by pop is the best. Woo, 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 everyone, rep. Um, but the good thing that they have on their side is John A. McDonald, because he's a fairly clever politician. And I'm really hoping we'll spend a, a little bit more time on John A. McDonald, because he is a fascinating guy. Um, he liked to show up to work um, drunk sometimes. Yes, that's that's right. Drunk. Um, yeah, he had a bit of a, of a drinking problem, and it sometimes came to work with him. Um... Which which makes like you know the old historical documents of the time really quite interesting to read because um, he's like belligerent and rude and all kinds of stuff. But um, so he's a very clever politician and he's able to actually work with the Parti Bleu. So those good old guys two slides ago with Cartier, Cartier Etienne Cartier. Uh, he's working with him to try and form a combined party, which is really smart really smart. So they're managing to form sort of a coalition, which they call the liberal conservatives. And so this is sort of an idea, okay, like, if we have the slightly more kind of forgiving and, and adaptable English people working with the slightly more adaptable French people, maybe we could make some things happen. And so that's, that's the plan. And so they're trying to form one government uh, that kind of thinks mostly the same way. They, they can disagree on a couple issues, but they're trying to just, like, get some stuff done. Because disagreeing all the time is not working. All right. Um, but there's a, one last problem that, that United Canada faces, and it is this idea of the double majority. And so, yeah, they're United Canada. So they have one, they, they sort of have, they're considered like one government. And so government has... To, for a, a bill to pass, so like you want to make a new law in Canada, you need to actually get a majority in Canada West and Canada East. So your bill has to be likable by French Canadians and English Canadians at this particular time. And so it's really, really tricky. It's especially tricky when it comes to issues of language and education and religion because they have a different language they have different views on education and they have different religions and so this creates all kinds of issues and that's one of the big big reasons that the government is inefficient at this particular time so um yeah they just they have completely different views and values and so government just keeps grinding to a halt they have just this one government for both colonies it sucks and so if they can if they can unite with some other colonies then maybe they can like structure a bigger kind of more uh intricate uh and a little bit more dynamic government that doesn't just get hung up on the same stuff time after time after time like imagine if suddenly there was another province that was really really catholic well that Maybe you could get some different representation on Catholic, on Catholic issues. What if there was another province that had a big population of French speakers? Mm, well then maybe they might vote differently. And so things start to get kind of interesting when you realize, like, oh, yeah, there, there is actually uh, a colony with a large population of Catholic people. There is a colony with a large population of French-speaking people. There is... Um, there is a large population of 
English speaking people, but they're not Anglican. So this thing, this gets kind of, kind of fascinating actually. And so because they didn't have provincial governments as, as we think of them these days, they didn't have their own kind of Christie Clarks and et cetera, et cetera. They've got no other form of government other than the government of United Canada. And so only with only one government, nothing was getting done. It was just like, eh, they're always yell arguing and yelling, and then there's another election, and then you pass your, your ballot, and they, they do the tally, and then, hey, there's a new government, and lo and behold, they're getting nothing done. It's time for another election. So Canada West and Canada East really, really needed a fix, and so maybe if they could just work with some of the other colonies, um, they could get, th get the ball rolling. They could add some some a fresh take on things, and so this is I'm I'm leaving you with a little comic. It has our good buddies John A. McDonald and George Brown here. The guy shoots him in the leg. Uh, who could be behind this? And then it's like John A. McDonald. He's like, I didn't do it, but I'm not gonna help you because I still don't like you. Um, there you go. And if you want to read more great little, I mean, this isn't super super funny, but it's also somewhat based in fact if you want to read anything more about canadian politics in humorous cartoons the cartoon website uh, hark a vagrant does a really good job because i believe the uh the author and artist is canadian and so she does a pretty good take on canadian politics throughout so that wraps things up for today so please make sure that you know the names of the people who was john a mcdonald what were the tories who was george brown who were the clear grits who was George Etienne Cartier? Uh, what was the party blue? Uh, why is he important when it comes to uh, French and English? Um, French and English cooperation. There, that's the word I'm looking for. Uh, who was Louis Joseph Papineau? And man, like that face. He just he he has so much character. That guy. Um, anything else you need to know here? Um, why railway? Why United States? Fear, etc. Um, so thank you very much. If you have any questions, please bring them to class. Have a lovely evening and good luck with studying for your midterms. So long.